Hey, I'm here on time. Good morning. Uh, Nate's going to be a little bit late, so I'm just going to kind of fill up some space with, I don't know, I guess I'll read a few things. I'm going to pop a link in here. We're going to do a poetry live stream. And um, it'd be great if people joined, shared some of their favorite poetry, some of their own poetry, um, whatever, whatever they like. Hey, it's good to see you too. Haven't seen you for a long time. Um, all right, I thought I would bore you all with a little story by Stephen Leacock because I happen to be uh, very proud of my Canadian heritage. And um, I love Stephen Leacock. <laughs> Does anyone know who Stephen Leacock is? He was actually a pretty famous Canadian. <clears throat> He has a couple stories that I really love, and I just love his humor. So I think this is a, a great way to start the day. <laughs> Let me see here. Where did I put him? All right. I'll just read you a little bit of his bio so you know more of more about him. Um Stephen Butler Leacock was born in Hampshire in England. In 1876, his parents immigrated to Canada and settled on an unproductive farm near Lake Simcoe in Ontario. Um, occasional financial assistant from assistance from England enabled the family to survive and to send young Stephen to Upper Canada College and the University of Toronto, which, you know, we're, we're all familiar with due to John Rubeke and Jordan Peterson, from which he graduated in 1891. So that just got kind of gives you a, you know, an era. So this is called Reflections on Writing. It's not a poem. It's a little bit of a, a funny little story. The writing of this paper has been inspired by a debate recently held at the Literary Society of my native town on the question resolved that the bicycle is a nobler animal than the horse. Okay, so this is, <laughs> this is their debate. In order to speak for the negative with proper authority, I have spent some weeks in completely addicting myself to the use of the horse. I find that the difference between the horse and the bicycle is greater than I had supposed. The horse is entirely covered with hair. The bicycle is not entirely covered with hair, except the 89 model they are using in Idaho. <laughs> the horse in riding in riding a horse in riding a horse, the performer. I'm sorry, I giggle when I read Stephen Leacock. Okay, guys, <laughs> so just hang in with me. In riding a horse, the performer finds that that the pedals in which he puts his feet will not allow of a good circular stroke. He will observe, however, that there is a saddle in which, especially while the horse is trotting, he is expected to seat himself from time to time. But it is simpler to ride standing up with the feet in the pedals. There are no handles to a horse. But the 1910 model has a string to each side of its face for turning its head when there is anything you want it to see. Coasting on a good horse is superb, but should be under control. I have known a horse to suddenly begin to coast with me about two miles from home, coast down the main street of my native town at a terrific rate, and finally coast through a platoon of the Salvation Army into its very stable. I cannot honestly deny that it takes a good deal of physical courage to ride a horse. This, however, I have. I get it at about 40 cents a flask and take it as required. <laughs> I find that in riding a horse up the long street of my of a country town, it is not well to proceed at a trot. It excites unkindly comment. 
it is better to let the horse walk the whole distance. This may be made to seem natural by turning half round in the saddle with the hand on the horse's back and gazing intently about two miles up the road. It then appears that you are the first in about 14 men. Since learning to ride, I have taken to noticing the things that people do on horseback in books. Some of these I can manage, but most of them are entirely beyond me. Here, for instance, is a form of equestrian performance that every reader will recognize and for which I have only a despairing admiration. Quote, with a hasty gesture of farewell, the rider set spurs on his horse and disappeared in a cloud of dust, unquote. With a little practice in the matter of adjustment, I think I could set spurs to any size of horse, but I could never disappear in a cloud of dust, at least not with any guarantee of remaining disappeared when the, cl when the dust cleared away. Here, however, is one that I can certainly do. Quote, the bridle rein dropped from Lord Everard's listless, listless hand, and with his head bowed upon his bosom, he suffered his horse to move at a foot's pace up the somber avenue. Deep in thought, he heeded not the movement of the steed which bore him. That is, he looked as if he didn't. But in my case, Lord Everard has his eyes on the steed pretty closely just the same. This next I'm doubtful about. Quote, to horse, to horse, cried the knight and leaped into the saddle, unquote. I think I could manage it if it read, to horse, cried the knight, and snatching a stepladder from the hands of his trusty attendant, rushed into the saddle. As a concluding remark, I may mention that my experience of riding has thrown a very interesting sidelight upon a rather puzzling point in history. It is recorded of the famous Henry II that he was, quote, almost constantly in the saddle and of so restless a disposition that he never sat down even at meals, unquote. I had hitherto been unable to understand Henry's idea about his meals, but I think I can appreciate it now. <laughs> that was written in 1910. So that's my little Stephen Leacock introduction. All right, guys, come on. Don't leave me here all by myself. I'm sure you all have a poem or two up your sleeve. I'm not good at, uh, like, I'm not Nate and I'm not Luke. <laughs> or Lance, for that matter. Um, I need people to talk to. That's how I process information. So please, Charlotte Mew. Debating it, evangel evangelism. Let's do it. Let's get Tunji in here. Come on, Tunji. <laughs> Noah, thank you. Two introverts. This is going to be a really quiet conversation. <laughs> it's just how it goes sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Have you got a poem? I do. I've been um I've been trying to write poetry for the last month or so so i have a nice have a bit of a collection of things to that i could read so i'm not sure where to start but you want to take a minute did you know that april is poetry month i remember hearing that a, a couple of weeks yeah. ago and we're doing a on the girl country discord oops there we go we're doing a challenge of a poem a day for the whole month and um I am such a procrastinator, like, it, yeah. And so this this is good for me because then I have to do it. And um, I have lots of poems in me, but they just all stay there, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, being forced to do one every day, I mean, actually, I missed the last two days, but I'm going to catch up. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm not that disciplined at all. I I might I might write the, the same amount, but I, like, I'll, I'll sit down for, like, 15 minutes. I'll, I'll like get a few out and then yeah. for four days or something, I won't do anything and then oh. it'll happen again. So it's, it's very infrequent. Well, years have gone in between my poems. <laughs> <laughs> they have. That's fair. Yeah. But yeah. you know, this is, this is the kind of the cool thing about, about the, the challenge. Um, you want to rise to it, you know, because they're in there. You just have to torture them out a little bit. 
definitely. Oh, Tunji. Tunji left all his poetry in a drawer in Sicily. Tunji, my son, is in Sicily right now. <laughs> with his with his wife and, and his little guy. They, they were in Palermo just yesterday. Yeah. All right. Well, let's hear one. Yeah. Um, this might be a fun one. My father thought the sun was a chariot, rising from the depths before a god takes mount, lit by a sacred flame in a joyride across the heavens, never considering the nightmare of maintenance on this holy charred car. I don't blame him. He couldn't have known the truth. The sun is a light bulb, maybe even solar powered. It rides on a steel celestial frame, endlessly devoted to its path. The glory of this invention of man. It fills me with awe to consider the latter use to fix our heavenly lamp. Mm. Ooh, I like it. Can you read it one more time? Sure. My father thought the sun was a chariot, rising from the depths before a god takes mount, lit by a holy flame in a joyride across the heavens, never considering the nightmare of maintenance on this holy charred car. I don't blame him. He couldn't have known the truth. The sun is a light bulb, maybe even solar powered. It rides on a steel celestial frame, endlessly devoted to its path. The glory of this invention of man. It fills me with awe to consider the latter use to fix our heavenly lamp. Nice. I have, I have, um, I have inklings of, I'm trying to think of his name right now. I think it's Mark Cone. Let me just see here. Um, he wrote a song, Silver Thunderbird. Do you remember that song? No. By any chance? <laughs> Here's the, I'm going to read it because I think oh, it goes well. Thunder. I think it goes well with your, um, oh, wrong. Where is it? Somebody wants to make a commentary about it. <laughs> I just want the lyrics. Silver Thunderbird. Hang on. Tell me if it resonates with you when you hear it. Okay. Here we go. Watched it coming up Winslow down South Park Boulevard. Yeah, it was looking good from tail to hood. Great big fins and painted steel. Man, it looked just like the Batmobile with my old man behind the wheel. Well, you could hardly even see him in all of that chrome. The man with the plan and the pocket comb. But every night it carried him home and I could hear him saying, Don't give me no Buick. Son, you gotta take my word. If there's a God in heaven, he's got a silver thunderbird. You can keep your Eldorados and the foreign cars absurd. Me, I want to go down in a silver thunderbird. He got up every morning when, while I was still asleep, but I remember the sound of him shuffling around right before the crack of dawn when I heard him turn the motor on, but when I got up, they were gone. Down the road in the rain and snow, the man and his machine would go. Oh, the secrets that old car would know. Sometimes I hear him saying, don't give me no Buick. Son, you must take my word. If there's a God in heaven, he's got a silver thunderbird. You can keep your Eldorados and the foreign cars absurd. Me, I want to go down in a silver thunderbird. Down the road in the rain and snow, the man and his machine would go. Oh, the secrets that old car would know. And I still hear him saying, don't you give me no Buick. Son, you must take my word. If there's a God up in heaven, he's got a silver thunderbird. You can keep your Eldorados and the foreign cars absurd. Me, I want to go down in a silver thunderbird. Mm. Did it resonate? Yeah, I think so. It's interesting the the connection there. <laughs> yeah. I know. I don't know why. It just uh you were talking about your dad, you were talking about an old car, you know, and the sun. Mm. And that's what came to my mind. I don't know, there's always something about that that sun mythology that I always always found really interesting about this 
both Egyptian and then also Greek about how there's just this the, the cycle of, of the god doing the task in the in, in the sky and then it coming to an end and then it just starting the next day. Sorry, I'm late yeah. to my own live stream. <laughs> not yours anymore. Oh mine. my, yeah, it's yours. It's all yours now, Sherry. Well, you always have equal ownership in every live stream. I shouldn't, have said, I shouldn't even said mine. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was in a class with Jordan Daniel Wood, and it ran late, but it was really good because it was awesome. But yeah, it went, it went quite long. Well, I read a little a little ditty about uh, a debate on um, between the horse and the car by Stephen Leacock. Okay. Who I love. Nice. And um, this wasn't a poem; it was just a little prose thing. And uh, and then Noah shared a poem from his own poem, which reminded me of the song "Silver Thunderbird" by Mark Cohn. So I read <laughs> I read the lyrics to that. <laughs> And I gotcha. think it only I think it only um, connected in my mind. <laughs> no, yeah, it was a great connection. You think? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. There's some. There's a. Uh, I don't know. Both somewhat thematic and emotional resonance of of I think the feeling of the poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was. Uh... Oh, here we go. No way your first poem depresses me, makes me never want to write poetry because it's good. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Tunji's recuperating. Fine, then. Mm. Yeah. Well, I also have... So when I first moved to where I live now, I was surrounded by um, some pretty old-timers, ranchers. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple down at the end of the road, and um, his name was Brownie, Hugh Perry, but everyone called him Brownie. Okay. And he he made he made um like he was like the ultimate cowboy back in the day, right? And he used to make all this leather work stuff. So he always wore like when whenever there was a occasion you know birthday party or a wedding or anything he would show up with a white shirt and then he had these leather cuffs that he would make you know and um and he was also a poet and he wrote a book he, he did a little book here can you see that reflections of a rambler and um cowboy poetry is really big in the area i live in they do evenings you know cowboy poetry evenings and I love cowboy poetry. It's great. So I just thought I'd read one that that Brownie wrote. He's gone now. And um, you're all gone now. It's kind of sad. You know, you live somewhere long enough and everybody just kind of goes slowly. Uh, so this is it. This is the, the title poem of the book. Hey, Nate, your, your typing is super loud. For some oh, reason. sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you can turn down your volume or on your mic. Oh, hold on a second. Let me check my audio settings. Yeah. It just seems like super loud. Um, all right. Here we go. Reflections of a rambler. When I think of the many weary miles these aching feet have traveled, all the good I have done with smiles and the hills that I've unraveled. Kicked out of the cheapest bar rooms to wake in the alley's dust, or dining in style with a baron, a duke, or a prince, if you must. Living in style in the Northland with a dame that is strictly class, pouring out gold like, like a crazy man, then winding up flat on my ass. Back to the trails of the wilderness, frozen stiff by the cold. No time to wonder at fate's caress. Keep on till you find the gold. Keep on, though the frozen sun stabs your eyes like a knife. Dream of the fortunes yet to come, the strike that will change your life. When I think of all the lonely trails these aching feet have covered, the many times I've won yet failed while close at hand death hovered, the heartrending crash of 4,000 feet as they hammer the prairie grass, a thousand steers in wild stampede egged on by the lightning's flash. No other sound has yet been born to fill the heart with fear, 
like the rattling clatter of horn on horn and the ball of a runaway steer. Nothing will stop these crazy brutes as they run with the storm at their backs. The cowboys try with shots and hoots to turn them in their tracks. And yet there's another side to this, to this life on the open range and to these men who are born to ride, who'll live to ride again. A life that's hard yet one that has its better moments. The rangeland peaceful neath the sun may reap the finest comments. When I think of all the things I've done, the camps that I've stopped in, the weary race I've fought and won to stop and then to start again. I've had my share of hardships, but I've also had my fun. My liquor I drank where I found it, yet no one can call me a bum. From the dazzling glare of the northern lights as they play o'er the frozen snow, the bitter cold of the Yukon nights when it drops to 60 below, to the ever-shifting burning sands as they flow neath the white hot sun, searing the skin of face and hands till you wish to God you were done. Yes, I've seen both ends of this old earth and worked the weary miles between, a rambler born and cursed from birth to follow the path of a dream. White water man for the logging camps where death is always near, riding the roaring cataracts with never a thought of fear, facing the canyon's toothy throat where the water roars o'er the stone, where few men would dare to take a boat. Here it's man and his God alone. A millionaire I could have been if I dared to settle down. For once I married a cattle queen, the owner of a town. No man rules his destiny on earth, though some are wont to try. Our lives are mapped before our birth and governed from on high. So when these feet begin to itch, and I get the urge to roam. Once more my job and friends I'll ditch and ramble on till God calls me home. There's a little, I don't know if you can see, there's a little picture, Brownie. Yeah, I used to live in, uh, I used to live in Elko, Nevada, and they had uh, cowboy poetry events mm -hmm. in, El in Elko. It's a thing. It's a thing. It's a lot a of cowboy poetry here in, in my little town. Like I say, like I tell people, I live in the land of cowboys and Indians. <laughs> truly. I truly, truly do. <laughs> so maybe I'll give you what, I'll give you something that maybe that could be, maybe it could be uh, lumberjack poetry. <laughs> Yeah, because it's certainly it's it, 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 it's inspired by my hometown. <laughs> it was from the hometown Reddit poem about your hometown uh, oh, uh, yeah. prompt that we had for the for Poetry Month, mm -hmm. and my hometown is uh, the sign that one the, the sign that you'll see when you come into it is timber capital of the world. So that's why I joked about the lumberjack thing. No, I mean uh, Nate can. Can you put uh, it? Yeah, the I'll DM like I'll DM him uh, the link to the Discord um, later. Later, yep, we'll do. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I called this Aberdeen Winter. Seattle is known as a rainy city. This is fake news. Seattle is damp. Seattle is moist. Mm -hmm. Seattle is misty. I am from Aberdeen. I know rain, rain that soaks through your socks and underwear, rain that when you take off your shoes at the end of the day, you feel that you, you feel your feet itch and the skin on your toes is wrinkled rain. So cold, it stings your face and makes you feel like you're drowning rain and wind that will tear your umbrella inside out and rip its seams, which is why the locals don't bother rain. So heavy that your streets are flooded most of November and December. And you have to walk to school in water up to your knees. This is the weather that produced the so-called Seattle sound. But the Melvins were Monty boys and Nirvana are native sons. No one cares about the rest. They were imitators and posers. That sound doesn't come from the fairy mist of Seattle. That sound comes from spending half your life soaked and trying to get dry. From a place where the sun is a figment of your imagination for half the year. <laughs> No, the nihilism of that sound was forged in a place of wet, eternal darkness. The se that sound is the sound of an Aberdeen winter. <laughs> mm 
Hey, Anselman, you should jump on here. You're a poetry lover. <laughs> Isn't he also an Aberdonian from the other Aberdeen? Yeah, probably. Aberdonian? <laughs> Is that what you call it? Aberdonian? <laughs> I don't know if that's I don't know if the folks from Aberdeen, Scotland call themselves Aberdonians, but that's what uh, folks from Aberdeen, Washington are Aberdonians, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna read one from that Kaido Love Boat. Um, requested. All right, here we go. It's by Charlotte Mew. And it's called So I Liked Spring. So I, I so liked spring last year because you were here, the thrushes too, because it was these you liked, you so liked to hear. So I liked you. This year's a different thing. I'll not think of you, but I'll like the spring because it is simply spring as the thrushes do. And uh, this is, I, I got this on a Scottish poetry website. So. Anselman, are you uh, familiar with Charlotte Mew? Is she Scottish? I'm assuming she is. Edwin Muir is Scottish. George MacDonald is. <laughs> 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 he just gets slipped in everywhere, you know. <laughs> We're just going to sneak in all the Scottish Universalists just to taunt Anselman, aren't we? <laughs> All right, you got another one, Noah? I do, yeah, I can share this one. <clears throat> the city blares, honking cars, sirens rushing into death. Radios echo the message of the generation, and our ears are tired. A small town rings, cash register doors, and endless ice cream melody. Corner gossip about a broken marriage and our ears are tired. A glade whispers, leaf percussion. Birds call and respond. Wolves bellow longingly for the moon, and our ears are tired. A desert hums, shuffling sands, crickets chirp in unison. Winds sweep through the cold night, and our ears are tired. Mm. We enter the earth, and all is silent and at peace. Well, all but a single voice, a tiny voice in the quiet corner, all this time ceaselessly singing. You're good, yeah. Noah. You're good, Noah. <laughs> Noah. <laughs> you, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Both image and music. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's the thing. That's very very good. Very very good. Okay, I gotta I gotta show this comment here. Woohoo! <laughs> no, I know he, but I, I, and I, and I love him dearly. Yes, <laughs> me too. All right, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do. Okay, so I have to tell a little story. This is a collection of Robert Frost's poetry, and given to me by a friend a long time ago because I told her that when I was, when I was in grade one, the teacher made a challenge, and said. The first person in the classroom who can write a story can go to the library. And I was like, oh, because I really wanted to go to the library. And um, yes, McMo, he has. Yeah, that's, that's typical. <laughs> so um, I wrote a story. I remember it was a story. It was like maybe three sentences. But I think that was a lot for a kid in grade one about a prince and a princess and a kiss, something like that. <laughs> and um, so I got to go to the library and the teacher said to me, you can pick any book you want. And I just was like, right, in this library. And, and this was a tiny little country school and the, the library was about the size of a broom closet. So, you know, and I'm just perusing all the books and looking, looking, and I pulled out the complete works of Robert Frost. And I said, I want this one. She goes, are you sure? I said, yes. <laughs> and um, and I, that's when I really fell in love with poetry. Right? So anyway, this friend of mine bought me this because I didn't have. She goes, do you have his complete works? And I'm like, no. 
And uh, I think she bought me this in like 1982 or something. And anyway, so I'm going to read you a few of Robert, because I just love Robert Frost. I mean, I don't have to read them all at once, but this one is a big favorite here. Mending wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone. But they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves and some so nearly balls, we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until your backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to little more. There, where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He, sa he only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand like an old stone savage armed he moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well. He says again, good fences make good neighbors. <laughs> nice. It's a good one. Hey, Matthew. You got one? Hello. Yes, ma'am. I have one. All right. <clears throat> Very uh, TLC inspired. Okay. I'm happy. <clears throat> I'm startled, staring at the stars. I bury deep. The soil hugs back. I snuggle closer the warmth of her core. I equanimize, calming my vibrations. I remember the familiar. I am encouraged. The cosmic melody whispers. I sacrifice now. In our universe of light, I awaken, embodied, human, conscious, and agentic. I stir in bed, shake the lazy, and stretch my sinews. I took to nature, playful animals entertain. I admire virtue, effort, and humor. I dance like the leaves, we shake in the cool. I jump in the game, and I learn as I play. I wrestle the ocean and surf the sun rays. I poke at the gods and pray they laugh along. I contemplate God. The unknown is my world. I'm consoled by the wind and the poem inside me. I talk to the when it rains as it wants empathy. I smile in silence and rejoice in exhale. I wish you your peace, 
to be, to participate. Wow, that was really good. Unfortunately, we lost part. We lost part of it because of your connection. So there are parts of it that were like lost, but the yeah. parts that we, the parts that we heard were really good though. Yeah. Matthew. So you're gonna have to come back on Arenas for us again when your connection is more stable. <laughs> <laughs> because it was really good and i love like yeah very much tlc inspired but in the best possible way it's amazing i loved it loved it that was fantastic yeah, thank you for really coming really on and sharing it. it that's great i'm gonna listen along and keep working you bet okay. you bet thank well thanks you so for coming much, on matthew. all right so i guess i'm up here um nate, so, nate. It, matthew yeah. asked matthew asked earlier who wrote that the the aberdeen the rain oh that was that was me that was mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. This is mine too. This is, this is, uh, this is, I'm just, I'm just going to read the poems that I've written so far for poetry month until I run out of poems. And then I'll, uh, then I'll start reading some other stuff. I might read, I might read some Dylan Thomas actually. Um, uh, and, uh, so this one, the prompt was to write a poem about an object that has meaning. And to understand, like, the title of this poem, there's a little bit of thing, there's a little piece of information I would need to share with the audience. And that is, is that in baseball, an immaculate inning is when you strike out all three batters on the minimum number of pitches. So you, like not only do not not only does nobody reach base, but you strike out the side on the minimum number of pitches. So it's a striking out the side on nine pitches is an immaculate inning. Um, so this poem is called Immaculate. So many times I have fingered your two hundred and sixteen bright red stitches and wondered at the contrast with your bright white exterior, which never lasts. The roughness of the seams are a pleasant contrast to the smooth cowhide that covers the, your innards of cork, rubber, and yarn. When you are new, you smell like the fresh upholstery of a car right off the dealer's lot. But soon, you pick up the living smells of spring, fresh cut grass and dirt. And where I grew up, near the rainforest and coast of western Washington, eventually you are bound to smell musty. Even in summer, the rain and wet are never far away. But even the smell of you musty and wet from the spring and summer rain springs back a flood of memory. We were up by one, and I ha and hadn't won a single game all season. My last start, I threw the first pitch over the backstop and walked the first five before striking out the side. I was always a ball of nerves before a start. I was the hardest thrower in the city, but I was wild. When I knocked a teammate unconscious in batting practice, cracking open his batting helmet, I was pulled from starting any more games. That kind of thing gets parents understandably nervous. But I was a kid, and I just wanted to pitch. We're up by one, and half an inning away from a legal game. But dark clouds were rolling in, and a thunderstorm was looming. I was on the bench. Coat surprised me by handing me the ball. If you go out there and throw strikes, we might get this one before it's called. I went to the mound. There was no time to think. I smelled you in my glove, already beginning to smell musty and muddy in the damp conditions. I was fully in my body, perhaps for the first time in my life. I don't remember any thoughts. I can remember what it felt like. Like a shooter in basketball, a pitcher can feel in his body when the alignment is perfect. The catcher didn't bother with signals. We knew what was happening here. If I threw strikes, they couldn't catch up with the gas. Nine times I threw fastballs. Nine times I felt my body in perfect alignment. Nine times I heard the crack of you hitting the catcher's mitt. Nine times I heard the umpire call, Steerick! The last time a thunderclap echoed the rapport of you hitting the mitt, and the rain came pouring down. 
The catcher rushed me and almost bowled me over with his joyous embrace, jumping into my arms. Then he handed you to me. I should have kept you forever, but lost you in a move somewhere down, somewhere in the passing years. We had one perfect moment together. I would never pitch again. But on that day, together, we were immaculate. That's great. I love it. I can uh, I can read my hometown. I'll read my hometown here. I read it yesterday on Nate's, mm -hmm. Nate's birthday bash. But I'll, I'll read it again. <laughs> I didn't want to write this. I didn't want to write this poem at all because I don't have a hometown, and the town I live in, I I can't stand it. <laughs> it's an ugly <laughs> town. <laughs> I mean, I live fifty kilometers away from it for a reason. Um. All right, here we go. So the hometown I live in was a cowboy town, okay? Like there's towns around it called 100 Mile House, 150 Mile House, because they were roadhouses on the way to the gold rush. All right. All right, here we go. It had barely been born then, fragile and thin, a sight for sore eyes, this town that I'm in. The ranchers and natives with sweat on their brow herded their cattle as they only know how. The loggers arrived with gold in their eyes and cut down the forests till nothing survived. Their greed lust grew busy, their smokestacks appeared, the smog filled the valley till all their eyes teared. The bellowing cattle to stockyards were led, loaded in semis like the walking dead. The village were, was traded for malls and big stores, the homeless now haunt all the alleys and shores. I remember the pictures the sagebrush and mud. I remember the stories. I remember the love. It grew with a flourish, a skip and a jump. And now when I see it, it looks like a dump. That's it. No love for your hometown, I see. <laughs> what was it? Uh, Slack said something about there being um, like Oh, I don't know what it's called in the story, but when the Shire gets destroyed in uh, Lord of the Rings, he, he he texted me a photo or like a picture of a big smokestack oh. in the middle of the Shire. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is with our town, because it started out really small and very... You know, it was logging and ranching and, and those kinds of industries. Everything got centered in the middle of town because people came from far and wide to, to do their business there. And so when you come into this town, it's like there's no industrial area outside of town. It's right there in the middle of town. And it just makes it ugly. <laughs> Golf poetry. Cool. <laughs> Golf is kind of a cool game, actually. Noah, do you have another one for us? Sure. Um, this is a this is a song that's been stuck in my head, so All I right. thought maybe I can read the lyrics. The song is called uh, "The Cure for Pain" by Me Without You. The cure for pain is in the pain, so it's there that you'll find me. Until again, I forget, and again he reminds me. Hear my voice in your head and think of me kindly. Let me be, let me be lowered down like a casket and buried just below her chest. Whatever I was searching for, it was never you, she says. The record ended long ago. We go on dancing nonetheless. I opened like a locket, and if you're ever cold, I wrote, there's warmth inside me. I'm the pocket of an old winter coat. But where she used to say I need you, now I don't. You'd only make the softest sounds like sugar pouring into tea. Darling, let yourself pour down, dissolve into the love who revealed himself there quietly to me. Jesus, have mercy on us. Nice. I've been waking up like every morning and that song has been like playing in my head. Is this a song you wrote? No, just one I've listened to. Okay. Okay. I wish. No, yeah. 
All right. I wrote. I I woke up one morning. It was like early winter, and we hadn't had any snow yet. And when I woke up, I could tell by the light in my room that it must have snowed. There was just there was just that tinge to it. And this melody came into my head, and I was just humming it. And I was humming it as I got dressed, and you know, humming it, and and I went upstairs and. Um, I was like, well, what is that song anyways? Mm -hmm, trying to think, mm -hmm, you know, and then I'm like, oh, I know. And then I found it. It was called Winter is Coming by Radical Face. And I'm just like, isn't that crazy? Like, I didn't remember the title. I just, the yeah. melody. And it was the, the day that winter was coming, right? And we had had our first snowfall. <laughs> I just thought that was so cool. How your brain works. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of songs that will like I've never I haven't listened to them in years, and they'll they'll pop into my head again. Mm -hmm. And they'll they'll be there, and I'll I have to kind of address it, or it's gonna just be stuck in there. And yeah, I have to sing it to exercise it. <laughs> I can't. Get song gets away. It's like, oh no, you better sing it. You're, it's not gonna go away. I usually throw it on repeat and then turn it up really loud, and I just exercise it from my mind. Yeah, <laughs> that's how it goes. <laughs> I love Radical Face. He's always doing a little bit of this and a little hey, bit of that. Hey, Father Joe. Yeah, I didn't turn Luke into Radical Face. I turned him on to Radical Face. <laughs> right, on to Radical Face. You know, because I got this fairy godmother reputation, right? So I just <laughs> Aren't you a fairy godmother? Well, that's, that, that, that's what Neil says, and I just want people to yeah. know I didn't turn him into Radical Face. Right, yeah, no, right, yeah, 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 yeah. So one of the writing prompts from the challenge was to think you know to describe something nostalgic and for an extra bonus you know uh don't name it right yeah so and it's funny because i i wrote this and that was that was what that was the prompt that inspired my immaculate poem i was just like the baseball was the first <laughs> thing that came into my mind it's like oh okay yeah so i just started like writing lines about a baseball and then <laughs> that's what came out well it was, it was actually kind of hard for me because my house is full. Like what people tell me when they come here, my son's like, mom, dad, this is like feeling like a museum in here. <laughs> it's just full of nostalgia, right? My house. But anyway, I wrote this one. Letting the horses out at the small gate. I watched my steps as the rise to the fence line rose steep. Horses, impatient waiting, nudging at the chain. There you are, lying in the dirt, as if just placed there, or dropped from a pouch. Picking you up, I hear children's laughter, small feet, I look around. I hold centuries in my hand, ingenuity, survival, abundance. I hear the chipping of flakes. I see them around me. I am transported. Merlin hits the chain with his nose. I let them out. Their hardened hooves pound the dirt as they pour down the rise. I put you in my pocket, heading for home. And nobody asked me what the item was in, on the Discord when I put that in there. I'm like, is nobody in this place curious? Like, <laughs> does anyone know what it is? Come on. Nope. Enlighten me, Sherry. It was an arrowhead. I found an arrowhead okay. behind our barn right. because, uh, yeah. So I'll read it again now. Letting the horses out at the small gate, I watched my steps as the rise to the fence line rose steep. Horses, impatient, wait and nudge at the chain. There you are, lying in the dirt, as if just placed there or dropped from a pouch. Picking you up, I hear children's laughter, small feet. I look around. I hold centuries in my hand. Ingenuity, survival, abundance. I hear the chipping of flakes. I see them around me. I am transported. Merlin hits the chain with his nose. I let them out. 
Their hardened hoofs pound the dirt as they pour down the rise. I put you in my pocket, heading for home. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the line about how the arrowhead was shaped should have given it away, but I didn't, I wasn't clever enough to catch on. Okay, this is the one I wrote for the, um, there was a prompt that for writing about an object of clothing that said something about who you are. And I had the hardest time with that, that with that prompt. And then I remembered when I was nine years old, I had this um, Detroit Lions jersey with Billy. Billy Smith was my favorite player growing up because I was I was raised. Even though I grew up in what in Western Washington State, I was raised I was raised up to be a Sooners fan because I lived with my grandparents and my grandfather was a huge. He was from Oklahoma and he was a huge Sooners fan. So. I kind of picked up the fandom from him, and I've been a Sooners fan my whole life. And my favorite player was Billy Sims, who won the Heisman Trophy for Oklahoma when he was at Oklahoma in 1979. And then he was Rookie of the Year in 1980 for the Lions. And so I wanted a Lions jersey with Billy Sims' number on it, and I got one. And I would, like, basically wear it. I wore it to death. Like I would just like I like I didn't want to wear anything else. And so this is the poem that I wrote about that lion's jersey. It's called Talisman in Honolulu Blue and Silver. When I was nine years old, I had a lion's jersey with number twenty on the back. Not Barry, who was great. You'll get no argument from me. But Billy, I was raised to be a Sooners fan, even though I grew up near the coast of Washington State. Billy was my hero. Wore that jersey every chance I had. Played tackle football at recess in that jersey. Stiff arm people and ran them over. Broke some noses with high knees. Never had a lick of speed, but I was impossible to bring down and ran with pure rage to make up for it. Didn't take long to develop tears in the sleeves from guys grabbing on and trying and failing to bring me down with all their weight. I was nearly twice the size of most of the other boys. It's muddy all the time on the coast of Washington during football season, so that jersey didn't stay pretty long. That didn't stop me from wanting to wear that jersey. Didn't care if it was muddy and torn and bloody. I taped my hands just like Billy did when I wore it. Taped hands go well with mud, sweat, and blood. Eventually, Granny made me retire it. She was embarrassed by its condition. Bribed me with the promise of a new Sooners jersey. Buster Rhymes, number four. But it wasn't the same. Buster was an electric player and all. But nothing I have worn before or since has ever made me feel so invincible. I don't care what analytics nerds or Canton voters say. The greatest running back, the greatest football player I have ever seen... War 20 in crimson and cream, and then in Honolulu blue and silver, Billy Sims. And I know this because he lent me some of his power when I donned that jersey, and nobody could stop me. Matthew is just loving that, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, wish, I wish your internet connection was better, Matthew. Yeah, I know. His poem was so good, and we only got bits and pieces of it, unfortunately. Next week. Next, Next week, week yeah. if you're not working. <clears throat> okay. well, I've, been on your, I've been on your channel enough, Nate, uh, with, with Luke. We're kind of hijacking your channel with all these four. I love it. it it's oh, approved hijacking. <laughs> uh, well, I was going to ask my wife if this is okay to share these. I I really only had one time uh, been moved to write lyrics and poetry and my wife Amy was kind of my muse and so mm -hmm. that it was amazing like that never thing that thing never came out of me so um so I just was sharing some of these things that I'd shared with her and I asked her it was okay to do these so at any rate um they're, they're kind of uh Singular and focused, but I'll, I'll throw my hat in the ring here. On the cool. Awesome, Link. I, I wrote this for her, and I think sometimes a lot more in lyrics and stuff like that, but I wrote this for her. It's kind of was 
inspired by Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, called Strands of Love. <clears throat> Two are better than one. Without love, little can be done. It is painful to fall when you are all alone, but a gentle hand up feels like home. Two strands of love intertwined, strengthened by a third, a power divine. A divine romance that will not be broken, a love so bright it can go unspoken. Lonely nights feel so cold until the warm embrace of true love's hold. On your own, feeling under attack until you find a love that has your back. Two strands of love intertwined, strengthened by a third, a power divine. A divine romance that will not be broken, a love so bright it can go unspoken. True companions with one heart, side by side to never part, able to face the storms of life, bound by God as husband and wife. Two strands of love intertwined, strengthened by a third, a power divine, a divine romance that will not be broken, a love so bright it can go unspoken. Mm. Love it. Beautiful, Lance. Love it. And then I have another one here called Sometimes Always. Sometimes days can seem like there is no room to breathe. Sometimes the mind overwhelms the soul, tossing trouble to and fro. Sometimes peace seems out of reach. Whirling emotions can beseech. Yet sometimes simple things can cause your heart to sing. Moonlit nights in ocean air, a mountain breeze in your hair, dancing slowly under the stars, lost in love that is no longer far. But sometimes is a masquerade, the failed imposter of always. Always is a different sphere, infinite and the never ending here. Always is where the soul abounds, always is set on unshakable ground. Always is where our heart should live with faith, hope, and love to give. Regardless of the place or time, always exists as our meandering line. To the truth we feebly seek when dark sometimes has us weak. While sometime moments come and go, always exists in the overflow, ever waiting for us to see the light it provides for us to be. Always faith, hope, and love abide in every mountain top and ocean tide. Always faith, hope, and love exists in every innocent true love kiss. Always faith and hope, hope and love embrace the wounded heart and the teary face. Always faith, hope, and love defeats the doubt that the, the demons lay at our feet. Always faith, hope, and love will be ringing out through eternity. I see sometimes for what it is, always is where I want to live. I feel it most when you are near, the infinite dance is so clear. Faith, hope, and love exist when we embrace and we kiss. I feel it when times seem bleak, to know a love that is never weak. Always is the thing I see when I look at you, my beautiful Amy. Mm. Oh, Lance, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Especially stuff that's that personal. That's, I feel flattered that you would come on and share it with us. Thank you. I asked her permission first because I wanted yeah, to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I shared the poem I wrote on the occasion of meeting my wife. I did not ask her permission, <laughs> but I knew she wouldn't mind, though. I told her I did it after the fact, and she's like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so I actually have some folks that are sending me poems to read for them, um, and so I'm going to share their poems. Mm, this cool. is, uh, so I got, so no one sent me um, a haiku and another short poem. And then Father Joe sent me a poem. So I'll just go ahead and read them. Who's the first one from again? The, this for, the, 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 I have two from Nolan and one from Father Joe. Oh, okay, cool. Um, they're, they're not very long, so I'll just go ahead and read all three of them. Yeah. 
Um, so the, this is a the first one is a haiku from Nolan. Black Arctic Aura hijacked to highlight green blue streaks of Aurora. One more time. Black Arctic Aura hijacked to highlight green blue streaks of Aurora. I like the music of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Nocturnal is the, the there's another short poem here. It's called Nocturnal. Voices in tomb with blossoming with the blossoming moon, wings that fly after the sun dies, eyes that gleam whilst humanity dreams, mouths that feed while the lesser light leads. Up with the nightingale, they sing until light prevails. And this is from Father Joe. He titled it True Man. Who swims in a pool on the shore of the ocean but the 40-something lost soul steeped in freeze-dried trope? Wine-stained saran wrap, liberal? Yet I, drunk on my own steez, look out on my sea, jagged she, wine-dark, wild, and yet is she not beset with her own lifeguards and lanes? Death markers, rules. When one pomegranate seed ends, five others offer themselves, and four additional chambers signifying the corners of the earth. The whole world awaits outside my pool. Father so, Joe. That's good, Father Joe. You should have got on here and read it yourself. I know, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Father that's Joe, that's good. That's good, dude. Yeah, really good. <laughs> <laughs> he says he wrote it in March. It's very good. Very good. I it's love very it. Very good. Man, who knew my priest was such a good poet? <laughs> isn't the role of like isn't the prophet priest, prophet, and king? It's kind of like a there's something um cohesive in those three things, right? Like the the Holy Spirit was given to the priest, the prophet, and the king. Yeah. Inspiration. I see. <laughs> I see. Poetry to me, I don't know why. Just the, to my intuition, it's like the thi I want to. I want to link poetry more, most closely to the prophetic vocation. I think that's why. I think that's why so many of the of there. There's so much poetry in the prophets. Like if you look at this, in, in the, oh. I mean Isaiah's poetry, like you know, yeah. Um, so you don't get um, prophecy if you're not if you're not sitting around <laughs> contemplating. Well, because that's what I mean. That's like <laughs> that's what I think. Well, yeah, because you're trying to like. But that's what the poet is doing is trying to mm -hmm. see what's really there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and you they're know, using you... they're using images, but what they're pointing at with the images is beyond the images. Right. <laughs> it's like it's not just like. Other, otherwise you would just write pure description and that would be it so like that's the whole thing is the poet is using the images and the music of the the music of the arrangement of the po poem and the images of the poem are all pointing to something beyond them mm -hmm. that and that's the epiphany that comes at the like a, a good poem a really good poem always like there's this epiphany at the end of the poem and like it, sometimes it's hard to articulate exactly what that epiphany is because it's by its nature pointing to something that's pretty far beyond itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I, one of the really interesting things that I found out in the Ethiopian in Orthodox Church, they start sending their, like if you're a young man, you start getting sent away. The first thing that they do for the first year is they study and write poetry. That's the yeah, first they thing they do. do. That. They have to do they have it to first. Do. Yeah. So that's and so that's an integral part. And then the other thing that's really cool about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is every week. They, so the, they also have these poets who are now even today, they're writing new poetry that will be read as part of the service Literally. each week. But they don't. Here's the wild thing. They don't keep but they don't keep the poem like they don't keep them. They don't write them down like it's there and then they just move on. So. Like, I just find that really fascinating that yeah, the yeah. start of the learning and the preparation that they've realized for 
for for young men who are going to become that are going to go into the churches you're going to spend the first part of your training in poetry isn't that amazing well because poetry is i think that's it makes to me that makes sense because like poetry trains is training your attention Mm -hmm. You can't write, you can't, like, you can't produce poetry without really honing your attention. Like, that's how you, like, that's how it happens. Um, you have to learn to properly attend to things in order for poetry to be able to come out of you. You know, I don't know, I don't know if this, uh, I don't even know if I have it right, so correct me if I don't, but wasn't the Queen of Sheba? Ethiopian and was yes. she not a cohort of Solomon yeah that tradition and is that, she, that that is one of the traditions that she was Ethiopian there are alternative historical theories but like traditionally she was held to be Ethiopian yeah right and then wasn't Solomon a little bit of a poet and maybe are you saying are, are you saying a little nostalgic and she brought that back over to her friends and she said you know what we got to be poet people we want to want to cultivate wisdom we want to yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. All right. well, i'll drop off i'll keep listening so. thanks lance thanks lance for joining okay, us okay i'm gonna read another robert frost go for it yeah maybe i'll read two because the first one's really short Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to dew. Nothing gold can stay. And I'm going to combine that with where is it now hang on one that i wrote here we go the green turns a brilliant yellow the purple ages brown autumn leaves fly and tumble and we all fall down ring around the roses the children sweetly sing Nate, your keyboard is so loud. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll start again. The green turns a brilliant yellow. The purple ages brown. Autumn leaves fly and tumble, and we all fall down. Ring around the roses, the children sweetly sing. While death guards the door outside, we dance on angels' wings. All right, and then I'm going to read this one here. It's called... On a tree fallen across the road, and then in brackets underneath, he has to hear us talk. The tree, the tempest with a crash of wood, throws down in front of us is not to bar. Our passage to our journey's end for good, but just to ask us who we think we are. Insisting always on our own way, so she likes to halt us in our runner tracks and make us get down in a foot of snow debating what to do without an axe. And yet she knows obstruction is in vain. We will not be put off of the final goal. We have hidden in us to attain. We have it hidden in us to attain. Not though we have to seize earth by the pole. And tired of aimless circling in one place, steer straight off after something into space. I'll read it one more time because I did a really crappy job of it. Sorry. The tree, the tempest with a crash of wood, throws down in front of us is not to bar our passage to our journey's end for good, but just to ask us who we think we are, insisting always on our own way so. She likes to halt us in our runner tracks and make us get down in a foot of snow, debating what to do without an ax. And yet she knows obstruction is in vain. We will not be put off the final goal. We have it hidden in us to attain. Not though we have to seize earth by the pole and tired of aimless circling in one place, steer straight off after something into space. All right. So I set before you a choice. 
Dylan or Dylan? So my son, my son Kenneth, who Sherry, who you were chatting with last night, his middle name is Dylan Thomas. And it's actually kind of both for Dylan Thomas and for Bob Dylan. So I can either read Fern Hill by Dylan Thomas, or I can read the Bob Dylan song that my that was playing when my son was born. You can read them both. Oh, I can read them both. Okay. Which one do you want first? Whichever one falls into your lap first. I have them both pulled up in tabs. That's why I was keyboarding. <laughs> you what keyboarder you? Just click, click on one. <laughs> okay. All right. So, well, the other question is, should, should I should I just recite the song or should I sing the song is the other question. Well, you have a good voice, Nate. What do you think, Noah? Ooh. I might need to, I might, I'll tell you what, I might need to go get a cocktail if I'm going to sing. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you could still it's sing. It's a little early in the day for that. I'm, on four, I'm actually operating on four hours of sleep, but I'm still, I'm very energized. It's like. That class with Jordan Danny Wood this morning was so good. It's like, it's funny because I was like, it's like, it was, I got up at four so I could like, you know, do the reading for the class beforehand because I had a busy week and I hadn't had a chance to get to it yet. So I got up at four and Hanson says this thing. All right. So, and yeah, as you know, I had a party last night and we didn't wrap up until around midnight. So it's like, I have four hours of sleep and, and I was like, you know, it's like I was kind of like dozing as I was reading, but then I got and I actually got into the class and it would just energize me. And then I got on here and this is energizing me. So, OK, so I guess it's sing then, huh? All right. So I have, we have a vote for sing. So I guess I'll sing the song. Dylan's tough to sing with. Dylan Acapella, boy, that you guys, that's not going <laughs> to. That's well, the right. Is- is oh it, my it, goodness! Bob Dylan. I'll try it. Yeah, yeah, Bob Dylan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, this is the this is the song that was playing when my son was when my son was like at the moment my son was born. You can't go wrong with singing a Bob Dylan song because he never hits the right notes anyway. So. <laughs> Early one morning, the sun was shining. I was still lying in bed, wondering if she'd changed at all if her hair was still red. The folks that said our lives together sure was going to be rough. They never did like Mama's homemade dress. Papa's bank book wasn't big enough. And I was standing on the side of the road, rain falling on my shoes. Heading out for the old East Coast. Lord knows I paid some dues. Getting through, tangled up in blue. She was mad when we first met, soon to be divorced. I helped her out of a jam, I guess, but I used a little too much force. We drove that car as far as we could, abandoned it out west, split up on a dark, sad night, both agreeing it was best. She turned around and looked at me as I was walking away. She said, this can't be the end. We'll meet on another day on the avenue, tangled up in blue. I got a job in the old north woods, working for a cook as a spell. But I never did like it all that much, and one day the axe just fell. So I drifted down to New Orleans, where I was lucky to be employed, working for a while on a fishing boat just right outside of Delacroix. But all the while I was alone, the past was close behind. I seen a lot of women, but she never escaped my mind, and I just grew tangled up in blue. She was working in a topless place. I stopped in for a beer. I just kept looking at the side of her face in the spotlight so clear. And later on, when the crowd thinned out, I was about to do the same. She was standing there in the back of my chair saying, Tell me, do I know your name? I muttered something underneath my breath that she studied the lines on my face. I must admit, I felt a little uneasy when she bit down to tie the laces of my shoe. Tangled up in blue. She lit a burner on the stove and offered me a pipe. I thought you'd never say hello, she said. You look like the silent type. Then she opened up a book of poems and handed it to me. Written by an Italian poet from the 13th century. And every one of them words rang true and glowed like burning coal. Pouring off of every page like it was written in my soul. From me to you. Tangled up in blue. 
I lived with them on Montague Street in a basement down the stairs. There was music in the cafes at night and revolution in the air. And then they started d into dealing with slaves and something inside of... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it's just too hard. It's like, it's too hard. Like, the pa like without music, it's too hard because the pacing is so difficult. I'm just going to read the rest of it. It's too hard. It really is. I just, yeah. I live with, I need music for this one, folks. <laughs> acapella, oh, acapella. You went a long ways without it. <laughs> I did. I did. I lived with them on Montague Street in a basement down the stairs. There was music in the cafes at night and a revolution in the air. Then he started into dealing with slaves and something inside him died. She had to sell everything she owned and froze up inside. And finally, the bottom fell out. I became withdrawn. The only thing I knew how to do was to keep on keeping on like a bird that flew tangled up in blue. In blue. <laughs> Sherry's <laughs> You can take over if you want. No, I'm good. If you if you feel like you want to sing it. Oh so no. Now... <laughs> I would never try to sing a Bob Dylan song. I would, if I did, I'd have to do. Jim well, there Bob. are Bob Dylan songs that are that are singable and not. I mean, you know. <laughs> so. So now I'm going back again. I got to get to her somehow. All the people we used to know—they're an illusion to me now. Some are mathematicians. Anselman Look at Anselm and go, Nate. Some are carpenters' wives. Don't know how it all got started. Don't know what they're doing with their lives. But me, I'm still on the road, heading for another joint. We always did feel the same. We just saw it from a different point of view. Tangled up in Tangled blue. Tangled up in blue. <laughs> he also does that song about like five different ways, depending on the recording and the version. Mm -hmm. He changes it up like, yeah. So that also makes it tough because it's like you're looking at the, when you're looking at the lyrics on the, when you're looking on the lyrics on the sheet, trying to follow it it made it like it doesn't it doesn't necessarily match what's in your memory because dylan sings that song several different ways so i like it when he shifts up the when he shifts up the when he shifts into the first person perspective more than the versions where he's using more third person or punk version of joker man Yeah, there's a great there's a great one. Every grain of sand by Bob Dylan. You want to read it or sing it? I don't know if I can sing it. I haven't sung for so long. I can just start. I can try starting, and then I'll just. Switch. You have a lovely voice, Sherry. You should. Sing <laughs> I'll just it. switch into reading. Well, that's what I had to do because it's just like no, it wasn't. The thing is, you got to start off in the right note. Yep. Otherwise, you find out you're way down low or you're way too high. Well, um, also, that particular song is like kind of like, mm -hmm. it's tough. In the time of my confession, in the hour of my deepest need, when the pool of tears beneath my feet, blood every newborn sea. There's a dying voice within me reaching out somewhere. How I thought it was where he's got here. See, that's what I'm talking about. But it doesn't. Toiling in the danger and in the morals of despair. Don't have the inclination to look back on any mistake. Like Cain, I now behold this chain of events that I must break. In the fury of the moment, I can see the master's hand. In every leaf that trembles and in every grain of sand. Oh, the flowers of indulgence 
and the weeds of yesteryear. Like criminals, they have choked the breath of conscience and good cheer. The sun beat down upon the steps of time to light the way, to ease the pain of idleness and the memory of decay. I gaze into the doorway of temptation's angry flame. And every time I pass that way, I always hear my name. Then onward in my journey, I come to understand that every hair is numbered like every grain of sand. I have gone from rags to riches in the sorrow of the night, in the violence of a summer's dream, in the chill of a wintry light, in the bitter dance of loneliness, fading into space, in the broken mirror of innocence, on each forgotten face. I hear the ancient footsteps like the motion of the sea. Sometimes I turn, there's someone there, other times it's only me. I am hanging in the balance of a perfect finished plan. Like every sparrow fallen, like every grain of sand. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, you picked a way more singable <laughs> song than I it's one I, I can sing. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, yeah, Tangled Up in Blue is like, oh, stop. Yeah. Tangled Up in Blue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was fantastic, though, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you for that. Beautiful song, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can share another poem. You yes, go please. for it, no? Let's hear it. This is um, another one of the ones I've, I've written. Tradition states one must stand still while firing the bow. Generation after generation did so until the prey learned. They were taught to run and hide. Yet the hunters stood firm in the legacy given to them. That year, a generation died of hunger. The first new song was sung and men learned to hunt. Wow. Can you do that one more time, Noah? Mm -hmm. Tradition states one must stand still while firing the bow. Generation after generation did so until the prey learned. They were taught to run and hide. Yet the hunters stood firm in the legacy given them. That year, a generation died of hunger. The first new song was sung and men learned to hunt. Really nice. Love the. Love I love it. all the connections. You're good. There. You're good, Noah. You're good, Noah. You're good. I love all the connections. I got a. I got a one. I got one about a, a man with a bow. Um, well then, then share it. Yeah, I'm just gonna find it here. Here we go. Like waves, one after another, after the next like thunder echoing from afar, approaching, like the wind as it blows, blustering, like birth with slow, steadily increasing pain, like wine aging, working silently in the cask, like grief, first one, then another, like seeds buried, dying and secretly denying it. Carrying his stick, he leans ever more heavily on it. Night, rises with the moon. Orion adorns the sky, drawing back his bow, aiming as he circles the earth, 
covering this multitude, a multitude. Night, the comforter, where all sleep, all rest, all hope, all pray for a little light. Wonderful. Okay, right. Oh, you go. Oh, no, I was just going to... Okay, so to make up for the Dylan debacle, I'm going to sing <laughs> uh, a folk song that I think that... That begun at some point it was a was a, a beautiful love lyric in in somebody's mind. So it's definitely still a poem. Uh, it's very old. Um, it's a, it's an Appalachian uh, folk ballad, but it's also like a lot of Appalachian folk ballads. It has its root back roots back in the old country. Um, uh, and so uh, I'm actually Anselman may know it, um, but uh, here it goes. Black is the color of my true love's hair. Her lips are like some roses fair. She's the sweetest smile and the gentlest hands. I love the ground whereon she stands. I love my love, and well she knows. I love the ground whereon she goes. I know the day it soon will come when she and I can be as one. I'll go to the Clyde and a morning weep for satisfied i ne'er can be i'll write her a letter just a few short lines and suffer death a thousand times black is the color of my true love's hair her lips are like some roses fair. She has the sweetest smile and the gentlest hands. I love the ground whereon she stands. I love the ground whereon she stands. Bravo, Nate. Great. I think we need a, a Ballads with Nate Heil album. <laughs> <laughs> All a cappella. <laughs> I'll need to practice my singing for next time. Huh? Yeah, really. Just turning into a little bit of a, a yeah. Well, I mean, these sto these uh, songs, folk ballads and stuff, they're, they're poetry, you know, mm -hmm. totally. Um. <laughs> you think you do, but you know. Oh, God, I love you. So. Uh. <laughs> I have, a, have one I can share here. Yeah. Um, I laid out my plans to my beloved. I revealed my destiny to guide the known world. How I, how I would be lauded by all men, reassuring her I would reject the advances of all women. I detailed how all wrath, or wait, sorry, all wealth would be mine. How I could provide her heart with all she desires, reminding her of my strength not to be corrupted by mammon. I whispered my ambition to speak and have it so. How I could shape the whole world with a single word, resting her hand in mine. For a moment, the vision fell from my heart. She just shook her head, looked at me, and smiled. Mm -hmm. I'm still thinking. Oh, that, 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 that put me in a contemplative mood. I liked mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, the sarcasm coming out of Slack is just... <laughs> 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 oh, I love that guy. We'll have to make up for Slack, it. You can't uh, mock until you get out there yourself and do something. Uh, he's been, you know, he has been, you know, he has been writing poems in the uh, yeah. for the prompts. Oh, um, I wrote. I'm going to read this one. It's called a young boy. I saw the young boy pushed and pulled, jostled about. A trophy. He was no man. He was a young boy. His hands held out, limp, useless, as if he were already dead, already dead, a young boy. Mm. I wrote that on October the 13th, 2023, after the uh, after the attack on Israel, actually. Wow. All right. So I suppose I'm going to read Fern Hill now. Fern Hill? Yep. For Kenny by Dylan Thomas. I, I'm going to be very tempted to. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to try not to accidentally fall into a Dylan Thomas impersonation as I read this and try to oh, actually read should. it in my natural voice. Oh, no, 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 you don't. No. <laughs> no. Well, let, just, you know. <laughs> I'm going to try really hard not to. Okay. So, now as I was young and easy under the apple boughs, about the lilting house and happy as the grass was green. The night above the dingle starry, let time me hail and climb, golden in the heyday of his eyes. And honored among wagons, I was prince of the apple towns. And once below a time, I lordly had the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the rivers of the windfall light. And as I was green and carefree, among, famous among the barns, about the happy yard and singing as the farm was home in the sun that was that that is young once only time let me play and be golden in the mercy of his means and green and golden i was huntsman and herdsman the calves sang to my horn the foxes on the hills barked clear and cold and the sabbath rang slowly and the pebbles of the holy streams all the sun long it was running it was lovely the hay fields high as the house the tunes from the chimneys it was air and playing lovely and watery and fire green as grass and nightly under the simple stars as i rode to sleep the owls were bearing the farm away all the moon long I heard blessed among the stables the night jars flying with the ricks and the horses flashing into the dark. And then to awake and the farm like a wanderer white with the dew come back, the cock on his shoulder, it was all shining. It was Adam and Maiden. The sky gathered again. The sun grew round that very day. So it must have been after the birth of the simple light and the first spinning place, the spellbound horses walking warm out of the whinnying green stable onto the fields of praise and honored among foxes and pheasants by the gay house under the new made clouds and happy as the heart was long and the sun born over and over. I ran my heedless ways, my wishes raced through the house high through the house high hay and nothing i cared at <clears throat> and nothing i cared at my sky blue trades that time allows in all this tuneful turning so few and such morning songs before the children green and golden follow him out of grace nothing i cared in the lamb white in the lamb white days that time would take me up to the swallow thronged aloft by the shadow of my hand and the moon that always that always rising 
nor that nor that riding to sleep i should hear him fly with the high fields and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land oh as i was young and easy in the mercy of his means time held me green and dying though i sang in my chains like the sea Ah, Rilke. Sherry, you're muted, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is this this is from Duino Elegies, and it's the sixth elegy. Hopefully, I do a good job here. Hang on, I gotta set myself up. Fig tree, for such a long time, I have found meaning in the way. You almost completely omit your blossoms and urge your pure mystery unproclaimed into the early ripening fruit. Like the curved pipe of a fountain, your arching boughs drive the sap downward and up again, and almost without awakening, it bursts out of sleep into its own sweetest achievement, like the god stepping into the swan. But we still linger, alas. We whose pride is in blossoming, we enter the overdue interior of our final fruit and are already betrayed. In only a few does the urge to action rise up so powerfully that they stop glowing in their heart's abundance, while, like the soft night air, the temptation to blossom touches their tender mouths, touches their eyelids softly. Heroes, perhaps, and those chosen to disappear early whose veins death the gardener twists into a different pattern. These plunge on ahead in advance of their own smile like the team of galloping horses before the triumphant pharaoh in the mildly hollowed reliefs at Karnak. The hero is strangely close to those who died young. Permanence does not concern him. He lives in continual ascent, moving on into the ever-changed constellation of perpetual danger. You could find him there, but fate, which is silent about us, suddenly grows inspired and sings him into the storm of his onrushing world. I hear no one like him. All at once, I am pierced by his darkened voice, carried on the streaming air. Then how gladly I would hide from the longing to be once again, oh, a boy, once again, with my life before me, to sit leaning on future arms and reading of Samson, how from his mother first nothing, then everything was born. Wasn't he a hero inside you, mother? Didn't his imperious choosing already begin there in you? Thousands seethed in your womb, wanting to be him. But look, he grasped and excluded chose and prevailed and if he demolished pillars it was when he burst from the world of your body into the narrow narrower world where again he chose and prevailed O mother of heroes O sources of ravaging floods you ravines into which virgins have plunged lamenting from the highest rim of the heart sacrifices to the sun for whenever the hero stormed through the stations of love, each heartbeat intended for him lifted him up beyond it. And turning away, he stood there at the end of all smiles, transfigured. Nice. Mm. So, uh, Matthew says he's home now, and yeah. it says he has it says a sister has some nice pieces. Um, um, yeah, nice. she, I don't know. I don't know how how much long, I don't, I I am going to have to. I like I said, four hours of sleep, and I'm starting to run out of gas. So I am going to have to bid you all adieu. Um, That's okay. I'll stay. I'll stay for if a you want to stay for yeah, and then if not and and yeah, so and I will definitely 
go back and watch so I can see it. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us and I'll let you keep the party going, Sherry. No, sure. it was good to get, have you on. And I think thank you're, you for having me. I think you're, you're a gifted, you're a gifted young poet. I hope you keep writing poetry. Yeah. Keep working. You right. should be reading All it on right. your channel, Noah. Yeah. You're good. I've been working on trying to find a format for it though. It's kind of hard to have like a 30 second video. That's just like, yeah. Poem. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm it's true. considering it. I mean, Love that, too, Matthew. That, <laughs> bye, Nate. All right, bye, bye, bye. Um, I mean, that that's kind of what a lot of these, um, Jonathan Demir, even sometimes I don't know. I haven't watched very many of your videos. Pardon me, but it's so hard to keep <laughs> up with everything that's going on, you know. But, <laughs> but you know, like all these little clip channel type things with music, and that's poetry. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, right? So. I think you can do it. <laughs> yeah. It's just trying, yeah, trying to find the right medium for the the communication of it all. I think I think yeah. uh Chad does a good job with his kind of uh like um video collages with poetry. So I'm trying to do something with that. Yeah. Um I wanted to read it's it's a part of a very long poem by George MacDonald. And um, in the poem, he he has a like a Dante Beatrice type moment where he meets a beautiful woman, and um, and that woman kind of opens up the whole world to him, and um, and he sees. Well, it's an encounter with beauty is is basically what he's talking about, and then he sees the whole world differently, but nothing ever comes of the the relationship between him and the and the woman she lives it's a happenstance meeting he's kind of awestruck he never sees her again and um but he 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 kind of dedicates himself to her and not to something someone that he knows okay like it's it's a bigger it's a way bigger thing right um and so at the end of his life, he gets sick with tuberculosis. And at the end of his life, he um, he writes her a letter because he's never actually said anything to her. Um, and I just want to read you what he wrote to her. And I have to find it here, so just give me a second. Um, I don't want to read too much of it because it's really long. Uh Okay, here we go. So he's very, very ill, and he 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 finally gets up the, the strength to write this letter. It says here, And now he rose to help the failing fire, because the sunshine came not near enough to do for both. And then he clothed himself and sat down betwixt the sun and fire, and got him ink and paper and began, and wrote with earnest dying heart as thus. Lady, I owe thee much. Nay, do not look to find my name, for though I write it here, I date as from the churchyard where I lie. Whilst thou art reading, and thou knowest me not, I dare to write because I am crowned by death. Thy equal, if my boldness should offend, I, pure in my intent, hide with the ghosts where thou wilt never meet me until thou knowest that death, like God, doth make of one. But pardon, lady, ere I had begun, my thoughts moved towards thee with a gentle flow that bore a depth of waters. When I took my pen to write, they rushed into a gulf, precipitate and foamy. Can it be that death who humbles all hath made me proud? Lady, thy loveliness hath walked my brain, as if I were thy heritage in sooth, bequeathed from sires beyond all stories reach. For I have loved thee from afar and long, joyous in having seen what lifted me by very power to see above myself. Thy beauty hath made beautiful my life. Thy virtue made mine strong to be itself. Thy form hath put on ever every changing dress of name 
and circumstance and history that sow the life dumb in the wondrous page recording woman's glory might come forth and be the living fact to longing eyes. Thou, thou essential womanhood to me, afar as angels or the sainted dead, yet near as loveliness can haunt a man and taking any shape for every need. Years, many years have passed since the first time, which was the last I saw thee. What have they made or unmade in thee? I ask myself. O lovely in my memory, art thou as lovely in thyself? Thy features then said what God made thee, art thou such indeed? Forgive my boldness, lady, I am dead, and dead men may cry loud, they make no noise. I have a prayer to make thee, hear the dead. Lady, for God's sake, be as beautiful as that white form that dwelleth in my heart. Yea, better still, as that ideal pure that waketh in thee when thou prayest God or helpest thy poor neighbor. For myself I pray, for if I die and find that she, my woman glory, lives in common air, is not so very radiant after all, my sad face will afflict the calm-eyed ghosts. Not used to see such rooted sadness there, at least in fields where I may hope to walk and find good company. Upon my knees I could implore thee, justify my faith in womanhood's white-handed nobleness, and thee its revelation unto me. But I bethink me, lady, if thou turn thy thoughts upon thyself for the great sake of purity and conscious whiteness's self, thou wilt but half succeed. The other half is to forget the first and all thyself, quenching thy moonlight in the blaze of day, turning thy being full unto thy God. Where shouldst thou quite forget the name of truth, yet thou wouldst be as pure, twice holy child, twice born of God, once of thy own pure will, arising at the calling Father's voice, doing the right with sweet unconsciousness, having God in thee, a completer soul, be sure than thou alone, thou not the less complete in choice and individual life, since that which saith I doth call him sire. Lady, I die. The Father holds me up. It is not much to thee that I should die. How should it be? For thou hast never looked deep in my eyes as I once looked in thine. But it is much that he doth hold me up. I thank thee, lady, for a gentle look. Thou lettest fall upon me long ago. The same sweet look be possible to thee forevermore. I bless thee with thine own and say farewell and go into my grave. Nay, nay, into the blue heaven of my hopes. And then he dies. And he um, leaves the letter for his sister to post after his death. And I don't know if I could read this, man. Anselman could read this to me. Because it's in a Scottish brogue. Um, I'll just read this part. What of the lady? Little more I know. Not even if, when she had read the lines, she rose in haste and to her chamber went and shut the door. Nor if, when she came forth, a dawn of holier purpose shone across the sadness of her brow, unto herself convicted, though the great world, knowing all, might call her pure as day, yea, truth itself. Of these things I know nothing, only know that on a warm autumnal afternoon, when half-length shadows fell from the mossy stones, darkening the green upon the grassy graves, while the still church, like a said prayer, arose white in the sunshine, silent as the graves, empty of souls as is the tomb itself, a little boy who watched a cow nearby gather her milk from the alms of clover fields, flung over earthen dikes or straying out beneath the gates upon the paths beheld, all suddenly, he knew not how she came. A lady, closely veiled, alone and still, 
seated upon a grave. Long time she sat, and moved not. Greet and sair, the boy did say, just like me mither when my father deed, and sign she raise and put a something sma, a glintin' glow goin', or maybe a blade, or the dead grass, and glided silent forth o'er the low stone wall by two old steps, and round the corner was seen no more. The clang of hoofs and sound of carriage wheels rose and died upon the listener's ear. So what the boy said there was basically he just saw her crying and she put something small on the grave and, and left. Or took something small from the grave, I think. A blade of grass and left. Did I do it, Anselman? Greet and say <laughs> This is George MacDonald, Anselman. What does greet and say mean, anyway? <laughs> and moved not greet and say just like me mither when my father did. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, I just love that. I love that plea to um, purity in the human being, in the woman. Oh, crying sore. Okay. That's what she was doing. Yeah. Because I have another translation that doesn't give the brogue. It just uh, says the actual English translation of it. <clears throat> yeah, she was crying sore, you know. So you imagine this woman who, who gets this note from this man who whose whole life was changed because of her. She, she didn't know, but he knew her, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's powerful. It is powerful. Yeah. And it like the first few times I read, I couldn't read through it without crying. Like it was such a, it was such a beautiful plea to holiness, you know, and what, and what beauty is and it, you know, the, the godliness of the whole thing. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Good old George. I'm going to make Anselman love George McDonald by the time we're done here. It's going to take years, but we'll get there. <laughs> I can uh, can share one one here, too. Um, how my head moves without a heart. In a line. Direct. Efficient. Cool. Cleanly cutting. Severing excess. A chrome-plated zero-emission train headed nowhere. An echoing booms through the hole. The frozen walls create a chorus. Wheels seize, naked, curled, hypothermic. That blasphemous question, that terrible phrase, that, chilled, that, that childish mantra. Why? <laughs> It's the best question ever, Noah. It is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I wrote one. I wrote, you, you probably know about this. I have to find it, though, because I can't remember what it's called. Um, it is, uh, let's see here, uh, yellow. Here. You know what the partic participative anthropic principle is, right? Um, maybe not by name. The, the observer is necessary for the universe to be born. Mm. Yes. I was reading about that and I was like, and I was, so I have this spot on my property where I go, there's a, like an old wall tent there and a porch and I like to sit there. And, um, and I was reading about this and there's, and then I had to go to the outhouse cause I'm like, my home has a, a bathroom in it. Okay. <laughs> but I always go outside and read and stuff. And so I, I had to go to the outhouse. So I went, and every time I went to the outhouse, there were these flowers that were hanging in my path and I always had to, you know, brush past them. And as the days wore on, they got bigger and longer and more in the path, you know, and I kept thinking I should rip these out. And then I was reading about this anthropic principle and I went to the outhouse and I came back and I wrote this poem. They block my path on the way to the outhouse. 
each head bobs precariously on bowed backs, smiling, bright, and eternally optimistic. I don't know their names, but they are everywhere. These stretch ever more tenuously across my path, asking to be seen. But what is my eye to them? Must it fall like the sun across their faces, a less glorious but still luminous orb? It seems so. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> There's, um, I, I've been trying to find a way to put it to words, but poetry has this ability of, um, where prose or, or science is able to kind of take something and break it down until like mm -hmm. it's little parts. Um, and it they dissects and and cuts things up. Uh, poetry has the unique ability to do the opposite, to be able to take something that's just so simple that can't be broken and needs to make it more complex to understand it. Well, that's like Blake's, you know, eternity in a grain, in you know, in in, in the palm of your hand, or how does he put mm -hmm. that, or in the grain of sand? Um. Yeah, like. This is what McDonald talks calls poetic relations. And essentially it's the cosmos as incarnation. That's mm -hmm. what I've, you know, in a very humble and um, reverent way reduced it to. And I don't think it's that much of a reduction because it's actually right. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what the poet sees. I think he Chester sees the world as incarnational. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the way Chesterton talks about one of the ways uh, he understands things is um, kind of the the rationalistic mind seeks to put the entire universe in his head, and his head cracks under the pressure. But the yeah. poet just seeks to stick his head into it, into the heavens, right, and just be in it. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then Douglas Harding would say that this is heaven. <laughs> <laughs> And so would George MacDonald for that matter, mm. right? That we're in God's imagination. Um, yeah, it's funny because I wrote something in a, in a comment yesterday that, and writing for me, I don't know how it is for you, but writing for me is always a way of understanding what I'm thinking about. Like I don't always know what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to see if I can read this or not. Let me, let me see here. Okay, I'll just read it. It's kind of stream of consciousness, but this this is the, the reason I'm thinking about it is because I just said poetic relations, the world is incarnation and all that, right? Um, so this is a part of the comment. And then again, the theme of face-to-face. -face. George MacDonald says in his fantastic imagination essay that a fairy tale is just a fairy tale as a face is just a face. He also says... So long as I think my dog can bark, I will not sit up to bark for him. This last one says, in defense, this last one he says in defense of not giving you anything of the meaning from his stories. He goes on to say, if it means nothing to you, then put it aside. I have thought long and hard about the face, God's face, my face, which I never see save for a reflection and the face of the other. If I take Harding seriously, they are all the same face. If I take George seriously, I will never know anything but subjective meaning. I think they are both right. It is in the face of the other that I see myself and come to know myself, and the same is true for them, and for all involved, we are staring at the image of God. Images, people are subconscious, and from there we derive our language, and in speech we convey those very subconscious images to our friend. And when he receives them, truly, he has entered our consciousness, and we have become one in God's imagination. I'm not sure what I'm trying to convey. I'm simply sharing connections, 
that pop into my head as I read. I can definitively, though, say that we are clueless about what it means to be face-to-face. MacDonald would then add, as you call it. One of my favorite reoccurring phrases of his. He is gentle and loving and kind in telling us that we can only name what we think we see. Perhaps one day we will know as we are known. I love this world. It is my home. Eternity is now. Creation is the already not yet. And birth is death. Yeah. That's great. Hmm. A lot there. Lots to think about. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like for me, honestly, like I couldn't say all of that in a live stream. I, I have to write it all down. I remember yeah. seeing, um, I, I remember seeing a meme once about, um, an INFJ meme, because I'm an INFJ in the Myers-Briggs, you know, scheme of things, which for an INFJ doesn't mean anything because they just don't think that they just doubt everything anyways. Right. They're like, whatever. (laughs) But this meme really hit home because it was a girl who was trying to talk and she couldn't. Mm -hmm. And then she was writing stuff down and she was just like, you know, her typewriter was on fire. eh? She was like, (laughs) yeah. And, um, and that's how I am. Like I, I, I mean, I talk, but I always feel like I'm not saying what I really want to say. So it's better when I write it down. Way better. I've, I've been trying to, to get my verbal communication to match. Yeah. What I'm able to write. That's a a long challenge. Not going to happen. Just give up. (laughs) I mean, you don't have to give up talking, but Mm -hmm. give up trying to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Let them both be what they are. I think, you know. Um, because it's better that way. And honestly, I think for myself anyways, part of the reason that I wanted to be able to say what I can write is because I don't feel like writing. (laughs) I just want to talk it out. Like, can I just say it? And apparently that's not the, that's not the deal. Yeah. You know, can't get out of it. We all have a little role to play, I guess. Yeah. I'm going to have to head out soon, but I can I can share a little bit more before I go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, me too. And uh, you go ahead, and then I, I can close it with, with another one here. I think Sounds one. good. I have, I have two right here. Um, cool. One is kind of a really difficult moment, and one is processing that after. So that's a, a good duo here. Mm-hmm. How long, my lord, will you elude me? I ache all over, with fever as my warmth. Smoke pours out of me, intangible, suffocating. Take my head into your breast, hold me. Where are you? I've looked and looked. You're hiding, watching. Can the game be over? You won. I need you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. And then um, this is the, the follow-up. The distance between us, an inch might have been a mile. In reunion, the wounds are still sore. I can't yet dance, nor can I sing. I do what I can. I hum a song, even if it's a sad one. I tap my foot to the beat. I hold her in my arms, all because I know peace again, and he knows me. Nice. All right, I've got to look in the index for the first line of this poem, because I don't know, I thought I had it marked, but I don't. Um, Okay, this is a well-known Robert Frost poem. I remember for a long time when I found out some someone said Robert Frost was a really grumpy old man. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm never reading his stuff again. <laughs> really. 
stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose house these are, I think I know. Uh, sorry, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. All right, well, this is like my favorite thing to do. So <laughs> always leave with a little bit of a heavy heart. But thanks for joining, Noah. Oh, thank you for having me. And everyone me. else who's listening. Yeah. And um, I think Nate's plan is to do one of these every Saturday for the month of April. So gather up your scraps of poetry, people. <laughs> and we'll see you again. Thanks. Well, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye, Noah.